Good evening and uh, welcome to this initiative uh, dedicated to circular economy and uh, organized by MUSE, which is the Science Museum of Trento in collaboration with the National Cluster of uh, Circular Bioeconomy Spring. My name is Mario Bonacorso, I am the chief of this uh, cluster. And we will speak about bioeconomy, that is uh, the use of biological resources coming from the earth, uh, the sea, the waste, uh, for the uh, industrial or energy uh, production and food production as well. This is an initiative uh, which takes place uh, as a preview of uh, IFIB, which is an international event uh, dedicated to industrial bioecology economy, uh, which will be hosted here at MUSE in collaboration with the autonomous province of Trento. And among the various uh, topics uh, uh, related to this uh, new economic paradigm, uh, today we will focus uh, on uh, uh, decarbonizing uh, the aviation industry. We have with us uh, two high-level uh, representatives of bioeconomy at an international level. The first speaker, Jennifer Holmgren, CEO of Lanzatech, one of the uh, most innovative and dynamic uh, companies in the area of uh, uh, recycling economy. The, it is based in Illinois, and I thank Jennifer for uh, being with us. She uh, will uh, be with us uh, from the US, and she will speak about uh, what uh, her company is doing. They use uh, CO2 produced by industrial plants as a feedstock to develop bioproducts, including biofuels for aviation. And they have very interesting partnerships, um, for example, with Virgin Airlines. And after Jennifer, we will have uh, Professor David Chiaramonte of uh, Politecnico di Torino, who is uh, an expert in bioenergy at a national and uh, European level. So we're very lucky because we have uh, two high-level speakers who will uh, focus on this very important uh, topic. Uh, bioeconomy is one of the pillars uh, of the New Deal, and uh, uh, certainly this uh, change in the paradigm is a fundamental element Della lotta al cambiamento climatico and, uh, e at, in uh, um, che a novembre si fighting uh, against uh, uh, change, uh, climate changes, uh, and uh, um, Italy will be organizing uh, the uh, meeting, and then uh, at the end of uh, uh, September we will have other events organized in Milan. So I'll stop speaking as a moderator of this uh, event. I would like to uh, thank again uh, the MUSE, the Science Museum. We are in this uh, very beautiful museum in the beautiful city of uh, Trento. I leave the floor to Jennifer. Uh, I thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming you in Trento and finally we will meet again after a long period and we will be able to discuss about circular economy and a fight against climate changes and also about what is necessary in order to uh, have this uh, change in the paradigm, uh, paradigm. And I'm sure that what you're doing um, is very important. So I'll leave the floor to you. Tell us about uh, what you are doing uh, with uh, Lanzatech, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you will uh, uh, be a source of inspiration uh, for all these uh, uh, problems uh, that we will have to solve. The floor to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Mario. It is... Uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to be with you, even if it is from Denver, Colorado. I look forward to seeing you again in person. Please allow me 
to share a few slides to talk a little bit about how we think about the bioeconomy and also what we are trying to do to change the trajectory of our carbon system. It is especially a pleasure to be with you, considering that Trento is one of the most sustainable cities in Italy and has already shown a carbon reduction of over 20% since 2019. Even more interesting to me is the story of the museum muse and how it is organized around a mountain to represent the earth and biodiversity. We also at our company use a mountain to talk about what we want to accomplish. This is the drawing from a child, a five-year-old child, one of our employees' children. And what we were trying to show is a, a world where every child could use a blue crayon to draw the sky. As you know, because of so much carbon pollution globally, this is not the case. My journey and my interest in carbon reduction started when I read an article that described my home country, Colombia. And in it, it said that by 2050, more than 50% of the useful coffee growing area in Colombia would not be able to sustain coffee growth. That means that Colombia would not be a coffee producer in our lifetime. This means that climate change is a fundamental change to our ecosystem. And it is not just about coffee. It is also about grapes. A two degree rise means almost 60% of today's wine growing regions will no longer be able to sustain that. And here are just some pictures because we're already seeing this change. You can see here a very fast snap that created cold weather in March, a very peculiar event, which then made it difficult after it, the buds had grown to keep agriculture in place. This is closer to home for you because this is a glacier in Trento with scientists starting to put covers over the glacier to ensure less melting over the summer. And of course, my home state of California is constantly on fire, as is the rest of the world. I think we really have to rethink. The problem is we talk about one and a half degrees or two degrees, but the reality is what we're actually talking about is climate tragedy. Any 0.01 degree matters. So we have to change the way we think and we have to bend the carbon curve. We absolutely cannot afford to continue to put carbon in our atmosphere. And I would say the best way to solve this is to tell ourselves that all carbon is precious, not just the carbon in diamonds, all carbon. And we must lock all carbon away. The problem is it's very difficult to do that because fossil carbon is in everything we use in our daily lives. It's not just in the power or the fuel that we use, it is also in the rest of the materials that we use. And while I would say that energy can be carbon free, already renewables are competing with fossil forms of carbon on a levelized cost, chemicals and fuels must have carbon. And I would say that that means 
that it's not getting rid of the carbon completely, but rather defining where the carbon comes from in our economy. We can learn a lesson from nature. Our beautiful landscape is also an outstanding way of recycling carbon. In fact, nature shows us the way. And man has then converted that part of nature into a bioeconomy by using fermentation to convert products that are made in agriculture to products that we use in our daily lives. My company is part of the bioeconomy, but it's a little bit different because what we do is instead of starting with biology and converting it to products, we use biology to convert waste feedstocks into products. When I talk about waste feedstocks, I'm talking about emissions from industry. I'm talking about solid waste. And I'll talk about today the fact that we have been able to change these things into the products you see here, which are things you use every day. So how does this work? How does the technology work? It's called gas fermentation. We have a bacteria, a naturally occurring biological organism that is able to take industrial off-gases, gasified solids, or even CO2 and green hydrogen and convert that to ethanol. We can then take that ethanol and make fuels like drop-in aviation fuel or drop-in diesel. But we can also make chemicals like polyethylene, like polyester, things we use every day. And of course, as Mario said at the beginning, it really is about the circular economy. At the end of the day, we can no longer afford to throw away post-consumer waste. We have to put it back into the circular economy and show that we can reuse it in processes, which is exactly what we can do by putting these things back into a gasifier. This is not science fiction. We have a commercial plant that's been operating since 2018 in China using a steel mill gas and converting that to ethanol. We've made 100 million liters of ethanol already, and we have prevented 130,000 tons of carbon dioxide from going into the atmosphere. The process essentially prevents the pollution, the CO2 from coming out and compresses that carbon into the reactors that you see here. And then inside these reactors, we can make ethanol. Excuse me. <clears throat> we are doing this globally. We have two operating plants. The first one at the top where it says Xiaogang Lancetec that I showed you a picture of, a second one that's running at a ferro alloy mill, and a number of others globally under construction. These are under construction to convert municipal solid waste, agricultural residues, steel, ferro alloy, refinery gases. So if you imagine what we're really doing is things that would go out the atmosphere, not just greenhouse gases, but whenever you burn carbon, you also have particulates and NOx emissions. Putting that in a reactor, converting that to ethanol, and then converting that to everything else that we use today. So let me show you some real examples because I want you to understand this is not science fiction. Already in Switzerland, in the Migro stores, Mebel is using ethanol made using recycled carbon in their household products. So imagine you cleaning your floor while you're cleaning the sky. Cody has announced 
that they will be using recycled carbon ethanol in their perfumes by the end of this year. Unilever is already using a surfactant that we made from ethanol from our plant in China. The ethanol is converted to the glycols, which are converted to the surfactants, and they end up in this product. We have also made this beautiful fabric. This has been made for Lululemon, and it will soon be apparel in stores. Again, recycled steel mill emissions converted to fabric. L'Oreal, this is only at pilot scale, has shown um, that they can make a cosmetic battle from polyethylene. Total Energies made the polyethylene, again, from ethanol carbon emissions. And one of the things that is very important in the bioeconomy, of course, is sustainable aviation fuel. And here is a picture after we converted ethanol to a drop-in hydrocarbon fuel that looks exactly like kerosene, like jet fuel. And we flew a plane from Orlando to Gatwick. This is after we landed. Again, all from recycled emissions. So I want to take you back to the slide because I'm sure very few of you could have imagined the day when a steel mill and its waste carbon could be used to make jet fuel, to make perfume, to make apparel, etc. This is the bioeconomy and it shows you what is possible. And so I would offer up that just like you can go to a store today and choose organic milk or fair trade coffee, that someday you will have the same choice, a choice of where your carbon comes from, whether you're buying jet a, a, a plane, you know, you're buying the, a ticket to fly to Italy from the U.S. What is the fuel made from? What about your tennis shoes? What is that made from? Is it all fossil carbon? But I don't think this is the whole story. I don't think this is enough. Because the reality is that we also have to conserve what, how much we buy and what we do with the products at the end of their life. I think we all know what the plastic problem is. And to me, what that means is that we have to create an economy where you return everything to the store after you're done with it, and it can be recycled back to something that also has a reduced carbon footprint. And of course, we never want to consider these approaches displacing mechanical recycling. Mechanical recycling is a great way to also recycle waste, and it is a low energy approach. So what we want to create is a world where there's complementarity. Things can be mechanically recycled and reused in applications that allow the use of mechanically recycled material and other things can be recycled back into their basic carbon and converted back to products. I have to go back to the beginning because the only reason I'm here is because we can't, can't keep doing this. We can't keep seeing this, or at least I can't. I strongly believe we have to rethink carbon. And I believe we have to rethink refining. We cannot continue to make products from the same feedstocks we've been making them to date. I believe we can harness clean power and biology to make everything that we need, to everything, everything. The potential is limitless. We already know that the power of the sun is limitless, but also the amount of carbon waste above ground 
is limitless. We can use these as our feedstocks. We have to redefine the process industry. We have to make everything from waste. That, to me, is the disruption that we need. The same as we have to go to electric vehicles or change the way our phones are made and what use they have, or even considering transitioning at least some of our diet away from animal products. I would argue this has to be the past. This has to be the future. The ability to convert CO2 that is either captured by a, a tree and what I would call the conventional today's bioeconomy, or whether it's a fossil carbon that we recycle capturing biology and green electrons. Either way, this has to be the way. And hopefully I have shown you that we have made everything already. These are all pictures of aviation fuel flights. And on the other side is goods that I have shown you we've already made from recycled carbon. Allow your mind to be blown away by the fact that this is real. We cannot afford to leave any carbon behind. Every last carbon atom must be recycled. Every carbon atom is precious. So I conclude with the words of Galileo. All truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. So that is what we have to do. Discover the new bioeconomy, create it and make it the thing that drives us. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. come al solito sempre molto efficace che ci ha consentito di entrare nel vivo di quella che è la bioeconomia circolare e di questo cambio di paradigma necessario davvero per affrontare quelle che sono le sfide di questo millennio soprattutto legate al cambiamento climatico e se non cambiamento climatico quindi il tema della urbanizzazione della deforestazione Jennifer ci ha fatto anche vedere come la bioeconomia abbia diversi tipi di applicazioni e siamo Here in Trentino, we know that in the field of textiles, Aquafil is already working together with another important American company, Genomatica, to produce a coprolactane from biomasses to produce a totally bio-based nylon. The textile industry, together with the aviation industry, are amongst the most polluting ones. There is a very interesting claim of Lanza Tejan. I would like to ask a question to David. Uh, the term is carbon smart. After listening to David, I will go back to Jennifer with a couple of questions, but let me ask David now, talking about energy. I mean, Jennifer told us that energy can be carbon free. Chemicals and fuels cannot be carbon free. So what does this actually mean thinking about the measures that will have to be implemented and that have already been implemented, uh, especially in the aviation industry, which is the industry we're focusing on tonight. I was really stricken by the fact that among the many measures to reduce environmental impact, France has decided to forbid those flights uh, that can be replaced by train traveling for a period shorter than two and a half hours. This is a policy that will change our habits. So sometimes it is better to take the train rather than the airplane or your own car. Then, of course, you need the necessary infrastructures to do that. Davide, would you like to comment on this? Thank you. I'd like to um, say hello to Jennifer. It's a pleasure to meet her, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Muse. 
and uh, it's a pleasure that uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, Galileo, who uh, was born in my land. Uh, well, so we have been uh, carrying out uh, research works uh, uh, which uh, are based on uh, carbon, uh, as is the case with uh, uh, Jennifer. Uh, normally, we speak about hydrogen, about renewable sources, uh, and uh, then uh, we will also speak about uh, carbon negative uh, actions. But uh, I think that Lanzatec and uh, Jennifer in particular has uh, focused uh, a lot uh, on uh, uh, carbon. Uh, and indeed, uh, we did uh, carbon. We need carbon in the right places. Uh, and uh, we desperately need uh, carbon. In the south of Italy, uh, there is no carbon in the soil. Uh, in uh, um, Middle Italy, we have uh, about 5%. Uh, so why am I speaking about soil? Because uh, the fuels uh, that you mentioned, Mario, will either come from uh, uh, recycling, as uh, Jennifer showed, and uh, which uh, can be done uh, on a biochemistry based uh, or by a thermochemical method, or they can come from uh, agriculture, by which I mean uh, uh, sustainable agricultural practices. Now, before speaking about uh, agriculture, I would like to focus on fuels. Uh, there are some sectors, and aviation is one of them, uh, which are a priority simply because uh, uh, these are uh, sectors uh, which are difficult to modify, so to electrify an aeroplane, well, perhaps one day we will have it, uh, but it's not something that uh, you can have tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So, uh, in order to uh, make uh, air transport and uh, sea transport and uh, heavy transport uh, possible, well, that requires uh, the use of new fuels. Uh, and in this case, uh, specifically, we need to have uh, sustainable fuels uh, which can come uh, from uh, different types of biomasses or from the uh, carbon uh, recycling uh, system. And uh, there are various uh, ways to fuel plants uh, based on uh, gasification. And in these uh, past few years, we've had uh, many initiatives which are being uh, developed in Europe and in the world. I would like to note uh, that, well, one of the slides that Jennifer showed uh, um, had the date of 2005. Well, I can mention other cases, uh, BTG, for example, uh, in the era of gasification, uh, where uh, these uh, uh, activities uh, started already in the 80s. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, Twent uh, University and other institutes uh, which started these initiatives in the uh, late 80s. What do I mean to say? I mean to say that there is a time which is necessary to bring innovation from the lab to full scale. So we need to be aware that it is uh, a, a path uh, which uh, requires uh, uh, time. Uh, but we don't have time to waste. Uh, we have to start. Uh, and the possible avenues are many, either uh, um, recycling of fuels, uh, for example. Well, but I, I would like to say that uh, um, we are at a time of crisis. Uh, we have the main energy companies in the world uh, and those who, which focus on uh, uh, transport, which are uh, suffering uh, because of uh, debt increase, uh, because the recent uh, pandemic has had a big impact on these uh, uh, sectors. Uh, so we are working in a very difficult context. Uh, uh, what is necessary is to have big investments which uh, uh, are required uh, to uh, uh, create uh, new plants. Uh, and in the uh, transport sector, all these uh, uh, 
uh, investments uh, are uh, major investments uh, uh, which require stable, certain and long-term conditions in order to be implemented. Uh, uh, because there are several conditions which are necessary in order to launch uh, such a project. So it is necessary to accelerate uh, because uh, uh, in order to get to uh, 10, uh, 20 or 50 plants, uh, because millions of tons are necessary because we consume more than 200 million tons of uh, carbon and about 80 million of kerosene, so millions of tons of oil equivalent products. Products. And so the plants that we have seen should have 40,000 tons, but here we're speaking about tens of millions of tons. So we need to have several plants and create supply chains. And this is a great opportunity because it has an impact on real economy, because if we uh, succeed uh, in developing uh, uh, supply chains uh, to um, feed uh, these uh, technologies, uh, well, we will uh, do what uh, Stiglitz uh, said uh, at the start of this uh, pandemic. Uh, he said that uh, probably countries uh, will uh, focus on stimulating economies and on uh, stimulating uh, uh, domestic uh, supply chains. So these supply chains uh, are a way for uh, developing and uh, stimulating and promoting uh, uh, domestic uh, um, economies. Uh, leading to economic advantages apart from environmental advantages. And this both in the area of carbon recycling, but also in the area of agriculture. What Jennifer showed us, uh, well, I could uh, make an analogy with what the European Climate Agency has said. We speak about minus 50% of uh, um, corn by uh, 2050. So minus 50% uh, uh, is devastating because we're speaking about food. Uh, and this because of the particularly severe effects of climate changes in the south uh, of Europe. So if by means of uh, uh, sustainable energy, and more specifically liquid or gas uh, fuels, uh, because I'm speaking also about biomethane, if uh, we can uh, uh, stimulate uh, agriculture, which is suffering a lot uh, because uh, uh, carbon uh, is lacking and you cannot have a healthy soil in order to keep uh, water and uh, uh, other elements, uh, well, probably we will have a double effect we will have a result in terms of emissions, so, and then we will have a result also in terms of uh, um, a greater success for agriculture. Well, currently in Spain, we are um, growing uh, cavalin and uh, barley. Uh, type of uh, cultivation that we call food and feed. Well, that's a pilot project, uh, and that is possible because uh, the sector of energy uh, going towards uh, sustainability can uh, support the cost of, of this uh, agricultural uh, change. Otherwise, uh, those uh, uh, fields uh, could not have produced uh, such uh, uh, products. So, in conclusion, well, uh, I'm aware that uh, our arguments are very complex. Uh, it's uh, uh, easier to speak about uh, uh, energy panels or, or other things. Uh, but I want to see the glass uh, half uh, full because uh, this uh, also means uh, to have many opportunities uh, 
Um, so let's uh, uh, use uh, complexi complexity, let's embrace uh, complexity in order to um, use the opportunities uh, which are there. So decarbonization of the air system in order to bring back carbon in the soil and support agriculture or uh, the recycled uh, uh, carbon based on fermentation. And well, the steel industry is another sector which requires a lot of carbon. We should not forget that. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, David. Well, I stay with you in order to uh, let people understand uh, the importance of these uh, topics. Uh, well, it will be possible to listen to uh, this uh, event uh, uh, on uh, YouTube and also on uh, uh, the MUSE uh, website. So we're speaking about recycled carbon. You made the example of our country where there is the issue of uh, the availability of biomass. Uh, and then there is the issue of the conflict uh, uh, fuels and food, uh, because if you use uh, um, uh, agriculture as an example, well, uh, there are people who say this uh, may be in contrast uh, with other issues. Uh, and in Italy, there is uh, uh, an issue about uh, recycled carbon, uh, but it uh, can also relate uh, to uh, see uh, biomass or organic uh, waste. And here there is a concept of urban bioeconomy. Jennifer from uh, Colorado underlined uh, that Trento is a sustainable city and it is no chance that Trento is one of the cities with the highest uh, uh, quality of life indices. So as you represent a university, what is the frontier of innovation? How should we support, how can we support innovation and how long does it take to have a, a practical uh, example, uh, results? Uh, well, with Lanzatech, we have an example of a real game changer. So a company which is really changing uh, the market. But how many Lanzatechs do we have around uh, Europe? Well, in terms of research, in general terms, uh, both uh, Italy and Europe are doing a lot. Also here at the University of Trento, there are many uh, initiatives uh, which are being carried out uh, by university uh, professors and researchers. So the real uh, uh, problem is what we call the mountain of death, because uh, when we go out of laboratories, uh, we uh, need uh, well, first of all, we need to have a regulatory uh, stable uh, system uh, because, uh, uh, as Jennifer said, there is a time uh, which is necessary in order to get to a result. And then we need capital, uh, a growing quantity of capital as we uh, make uh, uh, demonstration plans and uh, first of a kind uh, plans. And investments uh, in this sector are very important. Uh, it's difficult to imagine the production of uh, alternative fuels uh, on a small scale. And the US uh, certainly is a reference because it's a very dynamic place which uh, hosts uh, uh, different types uh, of uh, um, support uh, uh, for these initiatives. I'm referring to venture capital funds, etc. And then uh, in England, uh, we have the Carbon Trust, uh, which is a form of venture capital supporting uh, uh, mid-term projects uh, on frontier technologies. But this is what we need. Uh, and uh, it is uh, perhaps the area where Italy and Europe uh, need to do more because capital 
is uh, absolutely necessary. It is risk capital, and uh, as soon as uh, these uh, uh, projects uh, uh, are not bankable uh, for the time being, and so the European Commission should uh, um, think about a possible green uh, bank uh, and then uh, launch uh, other um, projects uh, with uh, funds uh, dedicated uh, to uh, the uh, scaling up of these uh, projects. So it's not so much a technological uh, problem. Uh, also in various sectors. So we do have these uh, skills and competencies at home in Italy and in Europe. What we need is uh, a system uh, and uh, fast uh, for uh, uh, having access to capital because uh, what is important is capital but also time. And this is uh, the most important element for me. And I will conclude by saying that we have to approach the system with a circular approach. And alternative fuels is an industry, it is a field where we have seen, and we see this in Brussels as well, uh, that there has been a linear approach. I produce biomass, I convert it, I produce biofuel, I consume it, and then I check my sustainability. This is due to the fact that the world of energy does not know agriculture. It is a problem of exchanging ideas between these two fields. See, the biogas dendrite model, the anaerobic digester, allows for the covering of the soil with cover crop and catch crop and the main crop, and the precious carbon emitted by the digester is then recycled in the soil to replace the fertilizer, the fossil fuel. So the agronomic rotation and the covering of the soil with alpha-alpha, a nitrogen-fixing plant, requires 34, 36 months. So you cannot approach in a linear way the agricultural field to produce fuel and use it because this means you do not understand the dynamics in this field. So we can support that system and make it more sustainable because today it is based on the massive use of fossils. The more the soil is impoverished, the more water and fertilizers I, knew, I need. So achieving a virtuous cycle in agricultural management makes agriculture more sustainable. Let me just briefly hint to residues and remaining waste. Well, the European directive mentions as advanced fuels, the fuels coming from rotational agriculture with cover crop or catch crop. So things are a little bit more complex. It is not just a food feed and residue issue. I mean, agriculture is a very complicated field. And you cannot have just a linear vision based on the year and envisaging the production of the fuel. And this has to be explained and communicated. And, you know, we have good examples in Italy already biomethane is produced and you know the digestate is the most important part uh, not the methane it is that carbon that nitrogen and those nutrients that come out of the digester and which are not the gas part of it thank you very much David Jennifer I would like to come back to you to deepen a couple of concepts that David has managed Industrial scale-up and communication, specifically communication. Every industrial revolution, every 
paradigmatic change and cultural change, like you told us, requires a dissemination of information and public awareness, because this is mandatory to enact policies leading to greater sustainability. Still today, many deny climate change. In your presentation, you've shown the proof of it. But last July, in Austria and Germany, there were terrible floods, a symbolic example of climate change. And also here in the South Tyrolean region, with the Adige River exundating and amazing rainfall in July. And Sicily and Calabria in the south of Italy, just like California and Greece, are burning. These are very dramatic events. And on top of this, we have uh, crime speculating on climate change. So my first question is, what should we do in terms of communication? And how important is the role of institutions to produce awareness, because very often in the United States, for instance, you had a president who denied climate change. On the other hand, how useful are the conferences like the Glasgow one, where there is a lot of talk, but very few actions are undertaken. And regarding scale up, well, we see in Europe that the United States are a model to follow because in the United States it is possible, and Lanzatech born in New Zealand is another positive example of this model. So a research project becoming a company, growing as a company, producing jobs, wealth, and attracting investments. Also, thanks to the presence of a higher number of venture capitalists in the US rather than in Europe and Italy. So how can you export the American model to Europe and to Italy? In Italy, there are a few venture capitalists Sorry, I believe we're no longer connected. We will try to reconnect with Jennifer. Jennifer, can you hear us? Can you please unmute yes. yourself? Yes, I can hear you. I heard most of the question and then all of a sudden I lost you. Um, you, you ended, I, I can address some of your points, Mario, if you would like me to. Okay, so there's, I see what you are asking me to comment on as two pieces. One is how do we get more energy around climate change when so many people still deny there is climate change? And then the other is how do we accelerate the path? So, so let me talk about communication. So first of all, I think the role of universities and institutions like David's and also the event that you're hosting today, Mario, are quite important because as we show more and more people um, what is happening, and more importantly, that there are solutions. Because I think one of the problems is people really understanding that there is a way forward. Um, one of the reasons I have focused on some of the smaller markets that I call carbon smart to make carbon smart products available is because what I want is a dinner conversation in somebody's home where they can say this was made from recycled carbon, not from fresh fossil carbon. To the issue of people who don't believe in climate change, 
frankly, it's the same as not believing that you should get a vaccine. And I think we've wasted way too much time on people that are negative. I think the only thing we have to do now is move forward. And every day we get more people on our ship. That's all we can do. We, we cannot keep fighting and going backwards. We just need to keep making progress and going forward. I think when you ask yourself the question about Europe versus the US, it's interesting because European legislation is further ahead on climate policy than American. However, what the US has is the Department of Energy and other funding resources who are always ahead. You, you know, um, they're always ahead of the current policy. They're always thinking about what they can do. And so I think that is one big advantage. And of course, Europe has that as well. So I think CINEA, for example, these are parts of the commission that are forward thinking, science funding, scale up funding. Um, and then of course we have a lot of VCs, but I am see sitting the venture capital community in Europe increasing quickly and seeing a lot more investment there. But my only message is it's great to invest in early stage work and fill the pipeline, but you also have to invest in later stage work and scale up because getting across what we call the value of death, which is where we can take a new idea or a new technology to scale is quite difficult. We need to shorten that period. So from a funding perspective, I'd like to see more support for scale up, but, but let's not waste any more time on people who don't wanna buy into climate change. Let's just change the world and they'll come along. I guarantee you they'll come along. Thank you, Jennifer. Unfortunately, when politicians deny climate change, that's the big problem, because then there won't be a proper policy. However, uh, we must move forward, the European Commission with the Green Deal and with the allocated funds for ecological transition. Uh, have demonstrated that there is a desire to move onwards, and this is reflected in the Italian National Recovery Plan. David, uh, would you like to just express your final opinion about the National Recovery Plan? We know that there is a very high level of expectation in Italy regarding the National Plan for Recovery to support us in this post-COVID period. The pandemics, like Jennifer told us, um, when she mentioned no vax, people against vaccines, um, but there is also a lot of talk about deforestation, climate change, and so on and so forth. So the post-pandemic recovery must be based on investments in circular economy and sustainability. So which is your opinion? So that we can conclude this meeting with a positive message for everybody, because the change is here. We are all experiencing the change, and we must become the protagonists of change with our daily actions. So just a couple of concluding uh, remarks about uh, the uh, resources. Uh, well, these resources will have to be used by 2026, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but we have uh, an objective uh, uh, set for uh, uh, 2050. So this huge uh, amount of resources uh, will have to be well targeted, uh, by which I mean uh, to create mechanisms uh, which uh, can be replicated uh, after 2026. So we need to change the system so that the system can uh, survive and uh, go on in order to achieve uh, the objectives uh, set uh, for 2050. Otherwise, uh, we will not have long-term results. Well, 
we um, wrote a, a letter uh, as uh, the academy to um, tell the government uh, that we are ready to help uh, and we are ready to support uh, that transition. So we are ready to support uh, that initiative uh, based on our skills. So the message is positive. We have large-scale opportunities there, and we also have small-scale opportunities, that is, initiatives which have an impact on a small um, situation, on small plans. So, well, there is no time to go into details, but there are a lot of opportunities there. So what is fundamental is that we invest resources well. And these resources are important uh, in order to change the system. That means to support uh, the transition. Let's uh, remember that uh, the Green Deal uh, should uh, leave uh, nobody behind. Uh, so that is the slogan. So we should uh, work so that uh, this transition is uh, a, a transition involving uh, everyone uh, without creating uh, uh, disasters. I, I don't think this is going to happen, but uh, it is a challenge. We have to grasp the opportunity so that the system can be converted into a sustainable system, producing returns for those uh, we, who have to implement it and uh, who can see it as uh, an opportunity for a new uh, growth, for a long term growth uh, so that their activities, uh, their farms, uh, their uh, companies uh, can uh, uh, flourish. So I am optimist by nature, so I see a lot of chances there. But we have to be very careful as to how we invest uh, our resources. Thank you so much, David. Uh, certainly, we are all optimistic. I would like to thank David. I would like to thank Jennifer. And uh, um, as uh, director of the Spring Cluster, it's uh, been very beautiful to have uh, uh, David with us and also um, Jennifer, who represents Lanzatech, uh, which uh, has been uh, involved uh, in our uh, group. And uh, um, I would like to thank all those uh, who have uh, listened to us, uh, those uh, in the hall, uh, in the conference room, and also those who have uh, uh, listened to us uh, online. I would like to thank the museum, the Muse, all the people who have collaborated, our colleagues. And I would like to uh, recall that uh, the next uh, event about bioeconomy will be uh, on the 1st of September at uh, 9 p.m. And we will have the Edmund Mark Foundation, who will speak about uh, the uh, excellence of research. And uh, we will speak about uh, circular economy in uh, local policies. And as Jennifer said, uh, this is an area which has uh, uh, made uh, sustainability a driver of growth, uh, and uh, it is an area uh, which has a lot of resources uh, and uh, um, also uh, resources in terms of agriculture and uh, forestry. So thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, David. Thank you all, and uh, see you again on September the 1st. Uh, uh, where we will speak about uh, circular economy and fight against uh, uh, climate changes. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here in Trento in order to see you in person. And hopefully we will uh, uh, forget about uh, COVID-19, uh, although we need to remember this lesson because uh, it's a lesson about the fact that we need to change our impact on the planet because we just have this planet. Thank you.